At one time, my guest billed herself as America's best-loved unknown cartoonist, but that changed forever with the premiere in 2008 of her animated feature, Sita Sings the Blues. The film draws on a classic of Indian literature to tell a timeless story of faithless love. It's been shown at over 150 film festivals and has won more than 30 international awards. And it was the struggle over the right to use the music in the film that led her into another area in which she's become known, that's copyright reform. Rather than protect creative people, she says copyright law actually stifles them. She has decided to challenge the law, engaging in what she calls intellectual disobedience. I am very pleased to welcome to Illinois Pioneers, Nina Bailey. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. So I want to I want to ask you about this unknown, known, unknown thing. At, on your blog, right at the top, it says America's best loved unknown cartoonist. But at some point, you crossed out the un. When did you know that you had gone from unknown to known? I think probably 2008 or 2009. It, it was right after CETA. So it was CETA. Out. It was yeah. the thing that, that put you on the map. Yeah. Uh -huh. When you were growing up, your dad was mayor of Urbana. Mm -hmm. He was also a math professor at mm -hmm. the U of I, but he was the mayor of Urbana. Some people watching may remember Hiram Paley, the mayor. And, and one of the things that I read was that you actually got hassled by kids because your dad was the mayor. Yes. What was their issue? Uh, I don't know. Um, I remember that uh, when I was in grade school, you know, I drew and I, I drew quite well. I was good mm -hmm. at art. Um, and other kids would say, you're just showing off because your dad's the mayor. And it was really <laughs> sort of heart wrenching. It's like, but, but I draw. <laughs> Look at my drawing. It's not because my dad's the mayor. As if being mayor of Bannon was some position of great power and, and influence. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think everybody when they're a kid thinks that somebody else is getting it much, much better than they are. So presumably yeah. it was just it was easy target. So you're at the U of I and you're studying art, but it seemed that what you really wanted to do was, was draw. And mm -hmm. I think that eventually you dropped out just because what you really because there was no curriculum for what you really wanted to do. Yeah. They didn't consider that to be serious. So you said, well, w uh, I'm going to do what I really want to do. Yes, that's exactly what happened. And I was actually inspired by Rudolf Hocken, who's a musician in town. Mm -hmm. um, he was a little bit older than me. And he had dropped out of the music department with like one credit to go. He had dropped out in protest because he was so you know, disgusted by the way they were teaching music. Um, and he was, you know, much admired around town. And I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. He since went back to school. I think he has a PhD now. I think he's a professor now or something. Um, but I just, <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> I, I left and I stayed away. And ma'am, my learning just accelerated so much once I dropped out. It's weird because, um, uh, I guess it's not that way for many people. Actually, I don't even know. Like, my, my family was scandalized when I dropped we, out. Really? Well, I would think so. Yes, yeah. college professor father and yeah. uh, smart siblings. And they yes. think, you know, what's smart wrong mom. with this one? Smart mom. Yeah, smart mom. <laughs> Jean is a smart woman. Yes, yes. smart mom. Um, yeah, and, you know, I consider myself smart also, but I really needed to, you know, learn. I needed to learn things that simply were not taught here and even yeah. if they were taught it wouldn't have been at the right pace yeah. i mean when i was finally free it's like i could you know suck up information at my own rate which was a lot faster than it was fed to me right. well i want to make sure that we get right to talking about sita mm -hmm. and and uh, the thing that made you took you from unknown to known was was sita but just to take a step back you when you were a teenager you started playing around with animation I, when you were 13 years old, mm -hmm. right? With a borrowed Super 8 camera? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Okay, so Clark McPhail, my next door neighbor, lent me his Super 8 camera. Um, and that was it. He was like, here's the Super 8 camera. Went into my basement. I made a little set out of construction paper and mm -hmm. a box and had some plasticine clay. And my first film was Godzilla versus Rubik's Cube. <laughs> um, the which, one? Uh, I think the Rubik's Cube one. Well, of course. <laughs> Um, and then I just made more films. Um, I even did like a community access TV show with a couple mm -hmm. other local kids, Joe Futrell and Rick Burkhart, who have since moved away. Mm -hmm. uh, I've moved back. <laughs> um, but I did that for maybe two years, uh, just played with the Super 8 camera, and then you know, realized that uh, I would not be able to have access to 
um, a larger gauge of film or sound equipment or a real animation stand or anything like that. Um, so I sort of learned as much as I could on Super 8 and then had to accept that I just didn't have the money or resources to go further with film. How, when, when you first started and you had this loaner camera, how did you even know what to do, or how, how to start? Uh, the books. I mean, Urbana Free Library had the animation book by is it Kit Lang? I'm not sure. It's a great book. It's a classic mm -hmm. book. And um, you can learn stuff from books. I think it had an instruction manual. Clark knew how to use the camera. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I dropped out. It's like you can learn stuff just by you know, mm -hmm. finding the information that you need to do a specific thing. And that's, that's always worked really well for me. Like, there's been a thing that I wanted to do, and then I've just learned what I've needed to do that thing, rather than learning a bunch of sort of abstract skills and then hopefully applying them to a thing. Yeah. Well, I, I realize we're skipping over some territory here, and we may come back because I'm interested in maybe having you talk a little bit about being a newspaper cartoonist mm. and what the challenges and pressures there are. But I want to really go to, to Sita and talk about, have you talk about how it is that came about. So tell the, tell the basic story yeah. of being in India, coming back, and then what happened? Well, it was actually before I came back from India. I went to India in 2002 yeah. following my then husband. And while I was there, I saw my first uh, Amar Chitra Kata comic books of the Ramayana and some other things, but it was the ones of the Ramayana and particularly uh, the death of Sita that really struck me. And I had some, you know, I was making friends with Indians there and I talked to them about it. And, uh, you know, I developed a, a s small obsession with Sita while I was there. And that was when I first drew that Sita character, thinking I was gonna make a comic book, just a little comic book. Mm -hmm about Sita, maybe four pages long. Then I went back to the US. My husband dumped me by email. I couldn't go back to India because of that. Then my obsession sort of changed and flipped, and I went from looking at Sita as this you know, sort of pathetic, helpless creature to identifying with her. Uh, at the same time, I heard the songs of Annette Hanshaw for the first time while I was in New York and became obsessed with her. and. You know, the songs were going through my head all the time. It was the only CD I played for weeks. And the two just sort of came together. I realized at a certain point that I loved them, loved the story of Sita and loved these Annette Hanshaw songs for the same reason, which is that they were describing this sort of fundamental story that I felt like I was living out yeah. in my own life. So the, in the, the Ramayana is this monumental work of Indian literature up there with the, the Mahabharata, the two major ones. And in, in the Ramayana is this story of Sita and Rama, yes. her husband. And it's, it's kind of a long story, but to make a long story short, she's kidnapped. Uh, she doesn't submit to her kidnapper. She gets rescued, but her husband doesn't trust her, doesn't sure with, isn't sure whether she's been faithful. She undergoes a test, which in fact shows that, he wa that she was in faith, faith, faithful. And though, so that, so you tell that basic story, tell some of your own story, include some material with some people who are Indian, commenting on the whole Sita story. It's it's a very interesting piece, and I want to make sure that people know that they can go online, if they have web access, and they can watch it. Mm -hmm. We'll also talk about about that that <laughs> yes. whole part of it too. But you're you're making it freely available to anybody who would like to to see it, and I really, I really hope that after seeing this, some people will go and watch it because it's wonderful. Well, thank you. It's wonderful. Um, anything, now, my, I've, I've, after that little tortured explanation of mine about what it's all about, is there anything else that you want to say to clarify, just in case people are still saying, well, wait a minute, I don't, I don't really understand, what, what is this film about? You know, when I was making the film, people would ask me what I was working on, and I would try to describe it, and they'd be like, what, what? <laughs> then they saw it and they're like, oh, oh, you know, when you talked about it, it didn't make any sense and I thought it would be terrible, but it works. So it's one of those things that mm -hmm. you really have to see. It's very, very difficult to describe. One reviewer called it the fulfillment of the postmodern promise. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a conventional narrative. It's not um, a normal storytelling devices that at the same time, it seems fairly easy to watch. Um, and as for the Ramayana, I mean, it's, it's Sita's story in the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Uh, what else can I say about it? Um, there is a problem in the film becoming as successful as it did, which is that unfortunately, and not by my design at all, it's become many people's introduction to the Ramayana. It was never supposed to be that. Um, it's funnier if you're already familiar with the Ramayana, although mm. people seem to enjoy it that don't know it. But there is this problem. It would sort of be like if Monty Python's The Life of Brian were your introduction to <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> yes. It's not supposed yes. to be that. It's, it's yes. for people that are already familiar with it. Again, I think if people see it, they'll, they'll get a sense of how it works. Uh, I think p partly, I, I, maybe as I think about it, there's something in, in the way you conceive the character of Sita in the movie, there is definitely something of Betty Boop in her and somehow the music and that seem to go together, I think. Yeah, a lot of things with the film just happened. I mean, I, it wasn't like I knew how everything was gonna work beforehand. I drew that design for Sita when I was still in India before I thought I was gonna make a film. I heard Annette Hanshaw later. And I was like, oh, these go together. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know beforehand. Right. And some people have said, you know, well, why didn't you get other music for the film? And well, the music started the film. I wouldn't have made the film had it not been for the music. Well, and that's, that gets us to the, to the copyright issue. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you're going to make a film like that, part of that is your original creation. But if you use something like music that somebody else has done, then the question is, well, who owns the right to that? And if there's someone who does, and if you want to use it in your movie, you're going to have to pay them. That's just the way, kind of the way the system works. You have to pay them if they let you. You can't just pay them. There's no. Oh, well, that's also, I mean, they, <laughs> they have to agree to let you right. use it, and then you have to pay them. They, uh, yes, that's true. Someone could very well say, no amount of money, forget it. You, you're not using my music. Right. Actually, it's the negotiating. It's the reaching them that's one of the hardest right. parts. Okay. So did you, this was, this now was music that was quite old at the time you came across it. Mm -hmm. So did you initially think, well, chances are that this, this was going to be in the public domain and you wouldn't have to worry about the rights issue? No, no, I knew from the start that I was oh, on, okay. you know, in dangerous territory and I had been warned from the start to just find some other music. And I actually considered that mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, thinking about it and just thinking like, wow, you know, I'm starting this project, I'm really inspired and the first thing I'm supposed to do is get rid of the part that inspired me. Um, and I just couldn't do it. And I realized, uh, you know, no one's paying me to make this movie. I can make the movie I want to make. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have to, you know, follow these rules. It's like, yeah, it might be an illegal movie, but it's gonna be the movie that I want to have exist. Well, you didn't, did you, did you start out thinking that you were just gonna say to, to heck with the copyright issue? Or did you think, well, let's, let's find out what it would cost, uh, and as it turned out, it would cost a whole lot. It, it would have initially, the, the figure that you were quoted was a lot of money. Yeah, well, you, you can't really find out what it would cost. I mean, there's no, it's, it's a constantly fluctuating thing. It's, mm -hmm. you know, there's different rights associated with every piece of music. So um, uh, one set of rights, which is the right to do a cover recording, that's statutory. That's like, if, if you want to, and I think that one's the publishing rights. Um, you know, if you, if you wanted to do a cover of these songs, wait, is it a cover? And you wanted to just, oh right, if you wanted to just release the audio like on a CD or perform it, um, there's a certain amount of money that you pay that's all been worked out. Um, you don't need permission, you just need to pay to the Harry Fox agency mm. who will distribute it to the right people. Um, but the problem was what's called sync rights, which is a different set of rights, which is to have that music uh, and it, <laughs> it's not even the voice of Annette Hanshaw, because actually her voice is in the public domain. So the, the notes and the words are not in the public domain, but her voice is in the public domain. But then there's sync rights, which is to have a picture at the same time as the music. So picture and sound in sync, um, which is a rather outdated concept. <laughs> like this was invented when you know sound movies were invented. Uh, but that was what I had to, you know, that was not statutory. That was what I had to get permission for and negotiate and, um, you know, ended up paying tons of money to make it legal for people to share the film freely. Yeah. It was for sync rights. So, it, so what I read was that the initially someone, someone said, how, whoever was involved in this negotiation said, 
What, $220,000 is well, what it would cost? Yeah, I mean, initially they said nothing. Like, they didn't return our phone calls or emails or anything. Mm -hmm. or they just would not communicate with us. And when they don't communicate with you, you don't have permission, and it's like you can't do anything. Um, so first I had to pay a lawyer, because they, on, they will only talk to lawyers and people that they know. Mm -hmm. So before it even started, <laughs> I was having to pay an intermediary. Then they came back with the... Um, yeah, whatever it was, it ended up being like two hundred twenty thousand. Like more, more than two hundred thousand. Yeah, it was more than the budget of the film yeah. for everything. Um, uh, but before they even got there, actually, I mean, first I had to pay the lawyer, and then I had to sign what are called licensing, uh, not licensing, festival licenses, um, which was I had to pay them money in order to have them continue the conversation. So before they gave me a number, they said, "Oh, you know, first you have to sign this thing that promises that." You will only show this film in festivals. You will show it for a year or less, mm -hmm. and you're going to pay us like a thousand dollars a song. Um, it was either five hundred or a thousand dollars a song. Um, oh, and you have to promise not to make any money. <laughs> so, you know, pay us money, sign this thing that reduces your rights even more, and then we will talk to you more <laughs> about the longer rights. So I did it. I mean, it was what, like I think eleven thousand dollars or something um, to, you know move on to the next step of asking them permission um, and negotiating the money. And that was when they came back with like the $220,000. Well, eventually it gets to the point where I think somebody said, okay, give us, give us 50 grand and we'll call it a day. Uh, yeah, well, not exactly. I mean, that, that's called a step deal. So um, I didn't fully clear the music. I cleared the music for free distribution of the film. So it's, it's cleared for television everywhere it's cleared for movie theaters until i make until it makes a million dollars or more at the box office mm -hmm. as reported in variety it's all these you know rules um and also for every five thousand dvds sold i have to make an additional payment if i paid them the two hundred twenty thousand dollars i would be able to just sell as many dvds mm -hmm. as i wanted but i have to keep track of the dvds that i sell and now you can see here what they probably weren't thinking about was this was giving me even more of an incentive to distribute the movie for free there was nothing in that about distributing it for free. Um, and studios regularly distribute movies for free to reviewers and, and uh, whatnot. Um, and those are called promotional copies. So I'm like, OK, promotional copies. Like, that's fine. I'm, you know, I'm into promotional copies. Um, don't have to pay for the promotional copies. I do pay for every 5,000 DVDs sold per the contract. Um, but uh, <laughs> love those promotional copies. You well, can download one for free. See, see now this is this is. If that's not confusing enough, now we come to the point where you're you're giving it away. So you've put all this this time. You sunk your heart and soul into the project. You spent all that time. You spent money, and you're giving it away. Yes, and I've never made more money in my life than when I started giving it away. <laughs> this is also very interesting. Now, I have to ask you about this be because I think I, I read that you um, you had some conversations with with some distributors mm -hmm. about distributing the movie, and they said, "Well, we think that maybe you'll you'll sell this many units and you'll make this much money." And as it turns out, distributing it for free, and then saying to people, "You know, if you like it, you could give me a little money," you're actually making more money than the distributors predicted that you would make by doing it the yes. conventional way. Yes, I am making quite a bit more money. Um, the reason being, so if you imagine you give it away for free and let's say one out of 10 people are gonna pay for it, um, but let's say 100 times more people are going to see it because it's free, well you've just you know multiplied your income by 10. And the fact is that the fact mm -hmm. that it's free, the fact that it's an audience distributed movie means so many more people have seen it than would have seen it any other way. Um, with, I have a caveat about that though, because at this point, um, people, people don't even care if something's copyrighted or not. So I, I bent over backwards to make it legal to share. Mm -hmm. What I've realized since is, I didn't really have to do that. Like people would have shared even if it were illegal to share. Um, so that was experiment one, and that, that sort of relates to my current project, um, <laughs> which I'll talk about in a minute. But, but they share it because they like it. Um, copyright or no copyright, they will share things because they like them. Um, I encouraged that, and 
uh, you know, the more people see it, the more likely it is you'll reach somebody that's going to be a fan, and once somebody's a fan, then they support you, they'll buy a DVD or a T-shirt or something. See, I think the, the, the problem here that, that some creative people will have with all of this uh, is that, uh, you know, there's nothing for sure, and you would like to have control of your work, and I, I, in the ultimate uh, defense, I suppose, of copyright law is, well, it's supposed to protect the creative person, give her ownership of the product so she can profit from it. And that if somebody is stealing from you by, you know, making pirated copies or, or, or whatever, then you have legal recourse. It's supposed to protect you. You know, wh what's wrong with that way of looking at copyright? Well, I'm curious, where did you learn this? Like, that's sort of like this idea that's in the ether, it's supposed to protect you and give you income. Where it must have been in law school that I learned it. No, I, I, I I guess that, I don't know. To, yeah. to answer your question, I honestly don't know. That was just my, if, some, if you just said to me, well, what's the purpose of copyright? Mm -hmm. That I would give you that little spiel right there. Where I learned that, I don't know. Yeah, so it's interesting. I started working with a nonprofit called questioncopyright.org. Mm -hmm. And that was before I decided to free CETA. Um, so Carl Fogel is the founder of questioncopyright.org. I met him uh, late 2008. Um, and that was when I began to seriously, you know, investigate what copyright was. Um, that is not the purpose of copyright. The purpose of copyright is to uh, promote the progress of science and the useful arts. That's what it says in the Constitution. Wow. Um, and uh, even before that, the first copyright laws were created, well, the very first ones were created in England um, for the purpose of censorship, which was a legitimate task at the time. Uh, and then they were expanded for the benefit of publishers. So um, the, you know, the sort of myth of copyright is to protect artists and that sort of stuff, that has come later. And now we have these very powerful copyright industries that um, you know, do lots of outreach and education about copyright, and that's where most of that stuff comes from, but it's very hard to separate it out. Somebody who's into copyright who's listening to me talk is going to be like, she is so biased, she is so biased. Uh, but I encourage people to read this essay by Carl Fogel called, um, I think it's called The History of Copyright. Is it? What is it? The Promise of a Post-Copyright World? I'll, I'll give you the URL later. But anyway, he wrote this essay, which is a you know, well-referenced history of copyright, and it's not what I thought it was at all. Well, you do, I mean, if people say you're biased, I, I guess I would say, well, she definitely has a point of view <laughs> on this, <laughs> for sure. We're all biased. Ha, has, a, has a point of view. Well, and, and it's a complicated issue that we could well spend an awful yeah. lot of time talking about, more than we have. I guess then the question would be, though, well, how, how would you like to change things from the way that they mm. are now? Well, um, there is this world of copyright reform. Copyright could be improved any number of ways, many, many ways. Um, uh, I don't know how many of them are politically viable at the moment, but many people are working on that. For me personally, I'm more concerned with just getting my art out into the world in this environment that may or may not change. Um, so I'm not so focused on political change for everyone. I am very interested in what actual people do on the ground, you know, in the actual world of culture. So one thing a lot of people are doing is uh, ignoring copyright altogether, sharing things that they like, uh, and just, you know, basically disobeying the law. Quite innocently, I mean, and quite happily, it's like, it's not a sinister thing. It's like, they'll just be like, I heard this great song, listen to this song. Um, or I saw this great thing, look at this thing. And that gives me hope. <laughs> um, so mostly I just want to, uh, you know, thank and encourage people that are doing that. Um, and that's really about it. I mean, people that I know that are actually trying to change the law, I'm very supportive of that. There are so many things we could do. We could, for example, get rid of retroactive copyright extensions. Um, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, we could add uh, responsibilities to 
um, copyrights. So, you know, yes, you can hold this copyright, that's, you know, so you have a monopoly on the commercial exploitation of it. If you're not commercially exploiting it, you lose your right. We could, if it's property, we could tax it like property. Um, in fact, that would, that would be great. Just a tiny little property tax on it would change everything. Um, but none of those things are going to happen. <laughs> or let's just say, you know, I'm not going to hold my breath. But I'm still an artist, um, and there's a lot of art people are making, and um, I want to, you know, experience as much art as I can and send my own art out as far as I can. That's a good place for us to stop. And also, I want to make sure that people know they can see your work if they just go to ninapaley.com. Yep, ninapaley.com. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And to you, we want to say thanks for watching. We hope you'll join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.